Uh, I'd like to introduce everyone to Abraham Martinez. Uh, Abraham is a director of photography based in Los Angeles. His work is featured in many Hollywood movies, such as Flight Plan, Spider-Man 3, Fast and Furious. And he recently broke ground in television, filming two shows back to back, Queen of the South, who we all love and know very much, and The Chi. Abe has always loved the art of storytelling uh, through images in the frame. After watching The Killing Fields in secondary school, the desire to integrate travel and photography in an adventurous career began to take shape. And since then, he's traveled to nearly 60 countries across the globe. His upbringing within the studio and global setting has equipped Abraham to contribute the best of both worlds. In his words, working on films has proved more than simply an adventurous career, but has triggered a passion to impact culture and shoot compelling stories along the way. Abe, welcome to Zebra Podcasts. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's a delight to finally connect and be here and share with you. Now, I know I connected with you probably uh, several months back, and it's, it's been just a crazy time for you, COVID and, and all sorts of hardships along the way. Um, but finally, we're here, and I finally get to ask you some questions. Um, so let's start right at the beginning. Can you describe some of your earliest influences into photography and what steps you then took to pursue your career? Yes, my father, my stepfather um, was a traveler. I uh, worked in the oil business, a lot of oil rigs overseas. And uh, he's really the one that first introduced me to two things, um, to different cultures and photography. Uh, I remember as a kid watching his slideshows from his travels. Uh, we would sit there, we'd make popcorn. It was a big slide projector that flashes, you know, from the white to the images. And uh, it's the first time I saw like a Coke bottle, uh, you know, in Arabic, you know, a different font so it wasn't quite like growing up you have the internet where you can be exposed to many cultures at once you have to really dig either national geographic or encyclopedia so for him to really share in a very personal way and enduring way was very uh you know also in a very big screen way uh photography and, and from there he kind of gave me his camera uh he was busy working being a father he just married my mother in a second marriage and uh he um he gave me the camera and from there I went to school and started taking pictures of my friends and I got into photography in the eighth grade in the dark room. And that's really where I felt uh, a passion uh, take over me. Before that, I loved to draw comics. I had my own comic strip that I would draw for, for many years since the third grade. Uh, so really putting stories into frames really developed early on as a kid watching TV, TV commercials of the kids playing with the toys. Uh, from cars to you know action figures and uh, I think I think as a kid the seed was planted not so much saying I want to be that kid playing with action figures but somehow it was like making the stories within these action figures is what was really drew me in uh, to really expand on that. So we're probably talking about G.I. Joe and Star Wars? Yes every, oh Star Wars definitely. <laughs> Star Wars is one of my favorite uh, action figures that I just had all those toys and the, the X-Wing fighters and yes, absolutely. And, uh, and just for um, people who aren't familiar with the whole schooling system in the US, so roughly how old were you when you picked up a camera? Maybe 12, wow. 12, 13, 13. Uh, and, but I think the intersection really took place not only having the camera in my hand and, and filming my friends and doing random things as kids do, uh, but it was also during the time when cable television was entering the home, uh, becoming readily available where they would show movies. Um, and, you know, when the parents were out, I was able to watch one specific movie that was really changed the course of my life was The Killing Fields. Uh, I watched, my parents were out, out for the evening and I, I flipped the channel and I just saw this movie that was looking back is very socially impacting um, in terms of history and a point of view of a, of a crisis event uh, on the killing fields. But for me as a kid, I, it was really when I saw a photographer, uh, John Malkovich, using a, a camera in a way that was very exciting. Uh, there was a moment where they developed the film and the, the, for the passport sequence 
And uh, I was like, I know how to develop film. So it became really a way for me to see what a career could be like as a photographer. And at that time, I was like, I was thinking about being a war photographer. Um, and, and CNN was making an impact on cable as well. And it kind of kind of wanted me to, to live the life of a photographer, a cameraman video, uh, to go travel the world because my stepdad was also traveling. So it was kind of strange intersection of, of a camera, photography, video, travel intersection, but it never as a kid was I thinking, trying to find films that had social impact and that would make stories in a multicultural way to shine a light on maybe injustice around the world and different types of truths that are coming out through the media. Um, but as a kid, it seemed like a very exciting career to be running around with a camera, dodging the corners and just being in the, in the heat in the heat of battle, if you will, uh, you know, sadly, it would be a crisis overseas or, um, or even things that could happen at home. But uh, that, that's still with me to this day, uh, but just in a different way now that we can put structure around it. And, and, and with the expansion of streaming television, I'm finding a, a lot of that still still ha has a reach through to when I was in the very beginning as a kid with my interest with the camera. I mean, you mentioned that a very poignant time and watching the killing fields. And of course, at that time, you had other sort of war documentary type movies, you know, Oliver Stone um, and Francis Ford Coppola all doing, you know, Apocalypse Now. And you had Casualty of War, um, Platoon and all of these really iconic um, politically charged films. So I'm guessing you probably saw a whole collection of those and then, and then went on to, to other things. Yeah, it, it, growing up, I went in. Uh, growing up, I was in a nearly 100% Latino neighborhood, and um, the fact that my stepdad married my mother and we moved to Houston, which which is a very multicultural city, and we moved to a street where I had my next door neighbor was from Jamaica and the Philippines and uh, Iran and Korea, and it was a port city because he worked in the oil business. So when I would go over to their houses and have meals and their family get togethers uh, in the, from you know, 10 years old, 10 to really 14, I would go to their houses and they would have um, Filipino movies on. We would have mm -hmm. Pakistani movies on, Korean movies on and television in their homes. Uh, and that also is VHS and you can see different movies and it, it kind of just seeped into me to have kind of a very broad global view and which I'm very thankful looking back at it uh, because eventually, as you, as you mentioned on the top of the introduction, I, I, I traveled 60 countries. And so I became fascinated with multicultural storytelling. And um, even when I went to college, I started taking more emphasis, less on production, but a lot on world uh, cinema. Mm -hmm. and, and just tell us about your, um... The, the study, where did you go to college and what, and what did you study? Yes, so I went to, um, well, during at, you know, eighth grade, 12th grade, uh, started taking pictures with Super 8. Uh, and I knew 100% I want to be a camera, uh, camera person since the eighth grade. So I went to the University of North Texas uh, and I got very lucky my junior year. I ended up working on a, on a, um, a, uh, kind of a B movie called Space Marines, and they took the old sets that were packed up from Running Man from Mexico, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger action movies. They packed up all the old sets, put them in a shipping container, shipped them out to Dallas, and I remember them backing it to loading dock and helping the art department offload these movie sets, these huge Arnold Schwarzenegger Running Man Total Recall sets off into the loading dock and I felt like I had arrived pulling uh, these old secondhand uh, action sets and we made it into a, a, a spaceships and we call the movies Space Marines. And after that, after my junior year in college, uh, I met, I got um, a job working at a, a mobile production studios, MPS uh, camera grip and lighting. And I got into the camera department uh, working with movie cameras by my senior year. So I was working part-time there and going to, going to college, University of North Texas. And I was already working in production. So I shifted all my studies, not towards from production, but towards um, uh, Hong Kong cinema, Indian, African, um, 
and I just really immersed myself because it, it seemed to me like it was the greatest escape to go see um, the foundation of, of art uh, cinema from from Ghana or India uh, and less about the I mean definitely studied American and, and neo-Italian neo realism and all these other uh, foundational uh, history, but I really felt more slanted towards global cinema. So I was working in production, and also at, during that time was when Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, there was like a, a big swell of, of wonderful movies that were coming out of Hollywood at that time. And, and even Oliver Stone was shooting JFK in Dallas at that time. And I remember trying to get as close to possible and as a college student, just trying to see, well, you know, Oliver Stone. And um, so it was a very, during that time, was, I felt like it wasn't quite ex as accessible as it is now with the internet. So you really had to go out and dig around for, for these movies. But in college, it, it just really wet the palate of, of how to look for these movies, uh, um, either a specialty grocery store that's uh, Indian or in the subtitles. It's very, very challenging. Now, I feel so lucky. You can just, it's so accessible. Um, but yeah, I went to the University of North Texas uh, studied uh, filmmaking um, in, in Denton, Texas. Now, you took the academic route. If you were giving the advice to yourself uh, now, going back then, or even to young filmmakers today, um, with all the resources and the internet, as you mentioned before, would you say going down the academic route or getting the college degree is as important as it was maybe back then, or are there other ways that people can get into filmmaking without going down the academic route? Yeah, the academic route that you're saying, uh, I think it's, it's, it's two parts. I think definitely in the beginning, uh, I think now you can learn a lot more about cinema. There's a lot of master classes that are online uh, that you can learn. So if there, I, I'm kind of, it, it really depends on the person. Um, if you find yourself really feeling, you know, a lot of technical know-how and you feel like you can just dive into the business, what I would recommend is if you really know that you want to go the camera route, which is, which is what I did, as I mentioned earlier, I worked at a camera rental house and worked my way up literally through the camera department uh, from the rental house to the loader to the, to the second AC first operator DP. So there's definitely, if you 100% know you want to go through camera, you can most definitely go the camera de uh, department route is going to the place that rents the cameras. And then just learn online, just know you're gonna have these steps to get to where you need to go so you can be self-taught with the history of cinema. Um, but you can also find lots of value, which I feel in terms of storytelling is to collaborate with others. So what college does, um, and university and um, uh, specialty schools is learn how to collaborate because the movie business, where in the photographer, working in a photographer, you're very much a lone, range, lone ranger, which I'm a street, I also shoot street photography. And it's kind of my meditation to shooting the real world and to see the rhythm of, of how the city works, the rhythm of landscape, the rhythm of a, of a small town when I'm doing street photography, the rhythm of shadows, the rhythm of light. And it's very, very inward. But going to college, you're able to develop skills for communicating your vision because you may be working with the, your classmates of 10. So what you want to do when time is money, as they say. So when you're work, collaborating with others, you have to be able to communicate uh, what you want and your vision is because you know we are so creative in the mind, but how to communicate that to others in a timely manner, which I think is a skill set that's always ongoing even while I'm even on a Netflix show, like we're trying to communicate new, new things with new technology. So that, that part is very important. If you feel like uh, that you might benefit from working with others where you've been shooting all the movies by yourself, then I say go to film school. Mm -hmm. if, you've ha if you haven't really done much production, then maybe go to film school. And, you know, so I think really it depends on, on your situation. Uh, but I think both avenues are great. I, I feel like I'm still learning. I'm going back to the way they block shots in black and white movies in the 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to shooting more with hard lighting, uh, how they did in, in, in maybe um, in, in the 50s. So I feel like I'm constantly learning. Uh, I don't think you ever stop learning. So uh, I think college is a, a great avenue for collaboration. 
uh, going to working straight away to the camera department is a great way to learn it technically. So it really depends on the person. Okay. Now, I, I, I ask, often ask this question to photographers of all sort of backgrounds, but still photography, videography, cinematography, um, do you have to be adept at one particular thing in order to do something else? For instance, do you have to be a gifted still photographer to become a cinematographer? And how would you say they're interlinked or are they not interlinked at all? I think, I think prior to digital, there was a clear separation with photographers, videographers, cinematographers, directors of photography. There's, there's many titles there. I think currently with the mix, mash, mix up of formats, resolution, um, the, there's so much overlap these days. I've been on shoots where I've shot the commercial motion picture part of a, of a promo, of an ad or shoot the stills or both. So there's a lot of blending uh, happening, you know, with mixed media in terms of storytelling. And I find, I, what I say is to lean into the artist part of yourself and think of this as a mixed media, much like a painter with, with gouache or acrylic, uh, to have your point of view come across the way you should and, and fight if you have a client or if you're doing a short film or a TV show, if you feel like that's part of the storytelling process, I think nowadays is very exciting where it, it could get very murky with the specs and the technical. But I think if you lean in toward the voice of storytelling, uh, I, I think that's gonna be really great for you as, as trying to mimic uh, a filmmaker who ha like Christopher Nolan, who has all the best toys and tricks and a really big engine to move his voice along. So find out the space that you're in. If you want to incorporate a still, if you want to incorporate digital zoom in, I think there's a lot of freedom there. But I think the most important part is to know what the story you're trying to tell and have that be an extension of your toolbox. I think those are wise words for any budding photographers out there. Um, this is probably quite difficult to explain, but um, can you share with us what a typical day at work is for you? And I, and I know recently it's been crazy, but just give us an inkling of sort of start to finish. What, what, what do you do day to day? Well, working, well, the current temperature in Hollywood now, as you know, we went from network. Now we have a, a ton of streaming services that are making shows. We had the pandemic. So there's been an inswell of trying to get content out. So we've been very busy non nonstop. Uh, so right after COVID things changed, we were doing 10 hour days with an hour lunch break. So it's like an 11 hour day total uh, minus the one hour lunch of shooting time, 10 hours. So I've just finished four seasons of television. Let me think, uh, well, yeah, four seasons of television at 10 hour days. Wow. And I'm currently on a Netflix show. We're doing 12 hour days Oof. of shooting plus, you know, 30 minute lunch. So, so it all depends on which template I'm doing. So right now I'm on a 12 prior to after post COVID shut down, we're doing 10 hours. So the way my day looks, <clears throat> yeah, doing camera, I feel like your body is a physical platform. So if you're operating the camera, you have to be healthy, fit and alert. It's a total mind body wellness. But on television, I don't operate. So directing, director of photography, you're responsible for the look of the show, the lighting, the tone, the camera movement. Uh, and the days, the days management of, of how we're going to get through the day and making sure every scene has the proper amount of time. So there's a lot of balls in the air to manage. So, so what I do a typical day is I wake up, I have a little quiet time with my coffee. Uh, and then I take the sides that we're shooting, the scenes that we're shooting, the script, and I look at how many scenes we're doing in the day and I kind of manage it, I put a pattern around that of trying to give the director and actors enough time within each scene so we don't rush through the day's work at the end. So I try to make sure it's a very balanced day in terms of having allotted enough time for, for each of that in preparation of going over with the AD in the morning and the director to say, this is how our day's gonna look time-wise. And then within that time-wise, looking at the script to see which, which is the tone for each scene. Are you angry in the scene? Is there a tug of war between two people? 
Is there a debate to fi figure out the tone of the scene? Uh, and then we try to build the, the, the scene and the camera and the photography around that. And also what kind of cameras, what toys we're using, the crane, uh, and just really plan the day. Uh, you know, is it a morning, is it a night scene? Uh, but also to have prep time, that's all that's taken care of. But I just really fine tune on the specifics on that morning. So I spend about, so I wake up, have some quiet time, maybe 15 minutes. And then from there, I break the script. I break the day's work down. Usually that takes 45 to an hour, 20 minutes. Then I show up to work an hour early. Before, if our call time is at eight, I show up at seven. And then I make sure the trucks, make sure nothing's, and if we're at exterior, make sure there's no trucks in the shot and, you know, any weird things that might have morning, talk to the team and just start getting the day started. So I'm really a big believer in getting a head start in the day. Um, and then we go through, we go through, we do a rehearsal and we shoot and we go through the day's work. And basically, since I start so early, I, I go, I come home and go, go to bed and it starts all over again. Uh, wow. And we shoot usually four, four to six months on the type of shows that I do. Um, we do, I work anywhere from 10, 10 or eight to 10 to 13 episodes per season. It's usually two shows a year. Um, but if I can, I can try to squeeze in a workout, even on top of that morning, if I'm lucky and usually run, trying to stay fit. I, I run for 45 minutes, you know, four miles, you know, at least try to do it for, you know, for four days out of the week. Wow. Now that's, that, that's sounds absolutely exhausting. Yeah, it, it can be. Wow. But yeah, you have to really eat well, try to get a lot of sleep. It's really hard to manage. Yes. And and how does that, I mean, how does your family sort of adapt to that sort of lifestyle? Is it a big shock to begin with or do, do, do family understand what the process is like? Well, in the beginning, I was, all the 60 countries I was going to, I was traveling a lot by myself on the road, commercials, documentaries, TV shows, movies. And then as I started moving up through the camera department, uh, it just seemed like I was always going to be on the road. So my wife and kids traveled with me. We, when I shot my first movie in India in 2010, we ended up selling our house and I actually moved to Kenya um, for, for a stint. And, um, you, know, it, you know, mentioning the killing fields, I think that stayed with me, international travel. And I really immersed myself to go abroad and to to really live that um, live, you call it a dream, but it's very challenging because you're displaced. Uh, there can be culture shock, um, but in that, as a photographer, as an artist, uh, you really grow in the sequence. Like, say, for instance, I did a documentary shooting in Colombia with a team out of Madrid, and you're really finding. You're having teams expand. The more you go abroad, the more you start building a team. I have a team in Spain. I have teams in Mexico, in Kenya, in India, in, in Sydney, Australia. You have a camp. You start developing friends and community uh, across the globe. And and so even now I'm on a. Uh, I, I just shot National Treasure for Disney Plus. I'm on Obliterated for Netflix. And a lot of times we're with the new technology of video walls. I can go ask friends, say, hey, can we go get a picture of Mexico City Square? Can we, you know, in Sydney, can Sydney Opera House, you know, we, I can reach out to friends that, that now have cameras that we can kind of kind of cross link and, and, and tell stories together from abroad. And also, I love the idea of, of why do we need to bring an AC to Kenya when I have a friend who's an AC in Kenya? Let's, let's keep let's keep the technical, let's use the technical know-how of somebody that's actually in Kenya. You don't necessarily need to bring, bring somebody from, from the States, or maybe there's a skill set we can bring that we can train my friend in, in Nairobi to learn how to use the Steadicam. So there's a really a, a cross, uh, cross link, cross training um, situation that I hope to empower and us grow as filmmakers, because I'm also learning how to, how to navigate my way in, uh, shooting um, in certain areas in Mumbai and different tools that they use. And, and then when I come back to the States, I'm trying these techniques, which, which maybe makes me faster and I can, that means more scenes I can shoot. So it's a constant state of growth, even uh, putting around with, with technology and, 
and know how and, and how to be nimble. And, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 wow. a, it's a ongoing process. And how does that influence your, your kids? Are they going to be budding filmmakers after traveling with dad well, and seeing the world? One, one kid is interested in, in filmmaking and directing and shooting and just filmmaking, being an artist, period. And my other son's interested in music. But yeah, they've been living, they've been living on the road with me uh, for the, since 2010. They've wow. been to 20 countries. They've seen a lot. They've really experienced a lot. Uh, my wife's a painter, so she's also having a global reach um with she's into her hearts with refugees and uh, refugee artists and just really injustice and but overall she's a complete artist painter so that's easy to, to travel with so we travel with paint and and travel with instruments and cameras we're quite the quite the traveling nomadic tribe of of artists what an incredible experience and, and particularly uh, yeah a true global educational experience for the kids it's that's amazing yeah they homeschool and sometimes every now and then you know like we were sh i was shooting filming in berlin and one of my kids were studying about the the, the berlin wall and, and the teardown and we were right there and another kid uh, we were in sweden or iceland was studying about vikings and sometimes the timing works out on the homeschooling and the, the you know it slowed down a little bit after the pandemic but prior to that we were constantly i mean i've been living in airbnbs for years straight uh going from show to show different different cities and ma making more friends and uh just having a blast of a change of venue and talking of um airbnbs and, and visiting you, you've been to the united kingdom haven't you oh yes and yes. Uh, i think you filmed uh, or worked not far from from birmingham that's right and brom we shot Aston Villa when they got when when they were changing their jerseys, their look. We shot a lot of footage for their big jumbotron, the big video screen, up and down and all around that stadium. Had a blast up on the pitch. It's been one of the most. Uh, it was a black. It was really a dream job, to because soccer is my favorite sport, and uh, now that that has become one of my favorite teams now. And. Um, but that, yes, Aston Villa, yeah, and Brom, <laughs> it was it's such a, even touring around different matches, uh, I hope to have a job like that again, or a soccer movie, a uh, football movie at some point. It's, nothing makes my heart beat more than uh, football. Now, um, let, I, was, I was just going to say, you kids probably don't need to watch any uh, historical Netflix documentaries because they're actually visiting the places to learn. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just a vivid educational experience. Um, the uh, I mean, let's talk about travel. You, you, you've you've gone to so many countries. Um, it's probably a really impossible question to answer, but just to give us a flavour. But where are your some of your most memorable or favourite places you've been to? Well, there's certainly a lot of them. I think recently, since I am shooting streaming uh, television, different situations, uh, I really do. Cur the currently where I'm at now. Uh, I'm using a lot of uh, research to bring authentic authenticity. A lot of times we have to, in New Orleans or Dallas, we have to cheat. We're in Colombia or Bolivia or Berlin. or So I do a lot of photography when I travel, even when I'm not shooting, constantly taking reference to get with the production designer and say, this is what it feels like. So that, that documentary I mentioned earlier, that I did with the team in Madrid and Colombia, we were going out to film the Embero tribe, which is deep in the bush down the river. It's about a eight hour, uh, eight hour drive and a six hour boat ride to wow. go into to film this tribe in uh, Colombia. But through there, you, ha you have to go through, um, through some very dodgy areas uh, where you would have to have a white flag in the boat and uh wow, and gosh. you're going into the unknown and uh and just carrying all this cargo and there's other cargo in the boat in Colombia. And, you know what is this cargo and where are we going and uh and just seeing just a really overwhelming beauty and adventure and i just snap away take tons of photo photographs so when i went on queen of the south i you would use these photographs to try to oh, mimic oh. the look or make the feel of we're actually in Colombia or we're actually in south america 
Um, so recently that's kind of where I'm at now, even when I was filming in Malta, taking lots of references and knowing if I ever get another show, I can go back to Malta and we can cheat this look. And, mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of time savings of trying to make, uh, different countries, uh, look, you know, cheat somewhere in Chicago, cheat as Mexico. Like, how do we go about that? And I find my, a lot of my travel has influenced the way we can make the show look and try to try to help sell it especially Queen of the South. We're all over the place on Queen of the South. Mm -hmm. um, um, but that's, but one of my favorite, some of my favorite places is absolutely Kenya. I think I'd like to move to Kenya. The light is so beautiful. The people, the food, the culture, uh, that to me feels like second home for me in Kenya and East Africa uh, overall. Uh, had a lot of influence of who I used to work for, my boss uh, when I was an assistant, um, a cinematographer, Scott Duncan who shared his love for Africa and it spilled over to me too. And I, I know it spills over for everyone who would probably ever land there. Um, I, had a, I had a great time in um, Chile. Um, Chile was beautiful. Uh, in Europe, Spain, yeah, I think that it really depends on the adventure. I think I had a one time in uh, Gabon, we had the president's helicopter and his helicopter team so it was like a team of four or five. It was a huge chopper. We had that for about a week and a half, just flying around Gabon, uh, filming giraffes and filming um, uh, gorillas. Uh, I think that those safaris, so far the safari adventure, it seems to be the most uh, adventurous in terms of filmmaking. Nothing like uh, uh, looking straight into the eyes of the hippo uh, with, with all your camera gear and, uh, getting so close to that um we filmed volcanoes in south pacific and just vo uh, erupting volcano lava shooting straight up into the air landing wow. about you know 50 yards from you and knowing that you have to look up so if you want to be okay you have to look up and not run away and get hit by it so wow. there's, there's all kinds of uh adventures that the amazon was great uh those safaris have been really adventurous just going out and sometimes you just have to fall asleep where you are in the adventure. And sometimes you fall asleep in a nice resort. So it all depends on the timing mm -hmm. of your adventure. And uh, I think a lot of that also came in handy when I did a national treasure for Disney Plus. Because uh, that's, I think the adventure still goes the same both ways. If I'm literally in an adventure on a four by four or helicopter or a swinging bridge, you're hoping to get across with your camera gear that's not too heavy. <laughs> or a little plane you you know did i overpack it with too many camera gear too much camera gear well or when i go to disney plus and we're actually with the production designer and figure out the tone of the of the cave the explorer's cave that we're going to do and making the vines look real and like and it's and you just step out oh it's a hollywood disney set and you step in and it's like oh no i'm back in the amazon so i i feel like i feel so lucky to be a camera person that gets to paint and and use your imagination, but also having experience with the camera where it was just me and a couple of filmmakers on an adventure and having somebody going through the bush with a machete. And then now for Disney, I'm shooting somebody going through the bush with a machete, but cheating it in New Orleans. So it's, it, it, it's, 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 I, I feel so lucky. So, we, so we have to, you are the Indiana Jones of photography. I think that, that would be <laughs> fair to say. Um, and, and during all of this extensive travel, it goes without saying that you must have experienced some quite hairy moments or quite risky situations. <laughs> Can you share any of those with us? Yeah, one of them was when we were flying over the French uh, Alps. We were in uh, Turin, uh, Italy for the Winter Olympics. And we had two, two days of helicopter work. And we were shooting the mountains in a raw state on a helicopter. The helicopter would land on the peak and then we would get off, do some time lapse, do beautiful landscape cinematography uh, prior to the Olympics so NBC Sports can have it. Um, and then uh, uh, then we just go from mountain to mountain. Again, it's like think of uh, the helicopter as your Uber. You're just going anywhere you want up in that airspace. And I think one time we had a little, little wind that wasn't in our favor and we lost control of the ship. And just for that brief moment, it's just silence and very scary situation. Sadly, the helicopter crashed the next day. 
with wow. the other unit with the West Cam, and it crashed in, into France, caught on fire. The team survived. They kept, they saved the footage. The producer ran back in, grabbed the footage, and then ended up walking for hours to the next village, but they were all saved. But it was the same helicopter team. Uh, we've been, I've been in the Amazon where we're, we're filming, setting up a shot, getting out of the boat, into the water, shooting, setting a time lapse, going around the corner on the boat. We went only to come back to see a local villager that caught an anaconda in the net in the very same spot that we were filming. Oh so those things you don't know about. So after you come <laughs> back, like I was, just, we were just here. Here's a big anaconda. Uh, we've been chased by rhinos, uh, stare down at hippo at a standstill. Uh, many, we have had some heavy plane situations about going over the canopy. I mentioned earlier about the volcano. Um, I've went through some very dangerous territories of cartel land where um, the, the, there's like real life drug lords situation, heavy bodyguard uh, shot in lots and lots of favelas, communas, um, barrios uh, in documentary world. Uh, and then I've also shot with Paris Hilton for, for 26 <laughs> hours straight, holding a camera at, at a club and running around. So for my sleep, that was a very dangerous situation, navigating around a bifa. So it, it's, it's going from glamor, anywhere from glamor. We've been in, I've been in the White House with President wow. Clinton, just roaming around with the camera. Uh, it, so it's been, the, the range of, <laughs> of, of the cameras really unlocked many doors, many situations that you can be in. So, but yeah, you always have to stay alert, healthy. Sometimes you go out on an expedition and you don't even know if you're going to even make it back because maybe the helicopter can't pick you up or a car can't pick you up or the weather conditions is too tight. They can't pick you up. So I tend to have this thing when I do expeditions, I eat in a fancy resort. I eat all the food, put muffins in the bag, put little foods that you can eat. And then, uh, you know, you just hope for the best when you go get on that boat. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, and you, at least you've survived and you're here to tell the story, which is uh, fantastic. Um, uh, let, let, let's go straight straight to Cartel Land, Queen of the South. Uh, what an amazing series. I think it was in the top 10 um, US Netflix list for, for so many, uh, you know, for such a long time. Um, I'm a huge fan of the show. What was it like working on, on Queen of the South? Queen of the South has been a game changer for me. Uh, at, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I worked on Fast and Furious. Mm -hmm. I worked on the, many movies. Uh, and to see the expansion of television and, and cable now streaming and to have new voices uh, coming, coming upon the scene uh, was interesting to me because there, you know, there was Queen of the South in Mexico and then when I heard about this project, I became very excited. Uh, number one, being with Delisi Braga, the lead actress, who is who is our who is who is the star of the show. But it's a woman lead in an action, an action series. Uh, and and also, what fascinated me mostly, not necessarily that it's surrounded in the backdrop of cartel, but it's about the human condition. It's about um, a lot of subtext of how women navigate with power. You have Camilla and the gifts that she has to either manipulate the situation uh, uh, with power. So I became fascinated with how to tell that story of someone who came from the streets to becoming a boss. And I think that template can go across many businesses as a woman and to see that point of view of the struggles, the biases, the situations that is set up in the world structurally, whether it's cartel or not in, in real life. So I think uh, also dealing with the Latino culture of machismo and to see how we handle that, those situations, uh, how men use power and machismo and, you know, yeah, we have guns, yeah, we have shootouts and drug deals. But uh, what really fascinates me is about the human condition of loyalty. And as, as, as you watch the season progress, um, even in season three with, uh, with, our, with our showrunners, we also put in situations of human trafficking mm -hmm. and uh, corruption within the government and 
we ended up touching upon uh, a wide array for five seasons uh, of those hi highlighting some of the situations the best we can storytellers and which made me very excited but i really love the idea of, of somebody who has a gift uh like teresa mendoza with money and wits and brilliance and how you can use that how we as people can use our gift and if somebody else like a gang member sees that gift they want to use that gift or if a teacher sees a gift, they want to help you grow that gift. So mm -hmm. it's really, uh, if you look at overall, that poverty is the enemy, not necessarily that person, drug dealers. It's just that the, that somebody got a hold of their gift, used it to promote, and then whether it becomes in the stream in in line with greed, then that's not a good gift to have your line. If you have your gift going on and uh, and helping people in situations how to get out of a problem, then your gift is for good. So a lot of the shows that I work on, The Shy, Queen of the South, uh, even National Treasure, I really go into the character. I don't go into it. This is a bad guy. This is a villain. This is a villain with a gift that has gone on the wrong path, and there's a consequence for it. So it really unlocks uh, a, 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 a prism for the camera to explore these situations. So so Pote in, in, our, in our show, you know, you can tell in the beginning he was one way, then he became aligned with Teresa. Then he, the, the, the gift of family, there's a lot of emphasis in the family dynamic of people who are displaced on season four of Queen of the South. And on top of that, in terms of the, the era that we're in and multi, you know, with streaming television, we want more voices. So uh, I feel Queen of the South is a very pan -Latin Latinx uh, TV series. We have Afro Latina, we have uh, Cubans, we, from the, we have also uh, uh, actors and characters from the DR, Bolivia, Colombia. So we're very pan Latinx and also having other cultures um, dealing, you know, with, 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 with to see the situations that they go through. So for me, it was very exciting in, in the range of skin tone for photography and, and storytelling. But also, it's also has to deal with mixed, mixed marriages, you know, uh, pote, uh, you know, Pote uh, and his relationship and Teresa Mendoza and her relationship that somebody's not part of her world, but you come to, from two different backgrounds, whether you're white or, or Latinx or, you know, it, it, it all depends to see what those characters, you know, I think uh, that's really also what fascinates me is because I'm in a multicultural relationship and my kids are multicultural and are, you know, are they Polish, are they Mexican, and how do they navigate? And, and uh, uh, I love leaning in a lot. And I think, you know, the, I love crossing borders, I guess, and blending borders and asking questions and, and really filming that exploration of the, 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 the identity of the character, that, the identity what the actor can bring and listen to what they have to say, what they can bring to the table. And, and there was a lot of major collaborations that were taking place during Queen of South. So it was a lot deeper, more so than just the cartel. It was also finding out what the showrunner's heart is of, of every season where they wanted our characters to go and journey and deal with loyalty. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Are we, are, are we going to ride or die together? Or like, how does that work? And, and we really put a lot of emphasis in, in relationship. I, I can really agree with you. I mean, what, citizens, citizens of, of the earth, um, and certainly exploring the human condition. And, and a lot of the uh, the modern shows are certainly very good at doing that. It's not as simple as black and white, and you know, who's who, who's the bad guys or the good guys. It's just that mixture of of survival, and and there are certain backstories to why that person is is like that, and the decisions they make. I think when I first started watching it, I thought it was like. Um, the romantic version of Scarface, if, if ever there was one, blended with elements of Prison Break, that there's just such an uh, amount of, you really want to root for these characters, but, you know, particularly Teresa. But again, it, it's the storytelling and, and what, you know, it's such a rich story. So, um, you know, thank you to your team, uh, you and your team and everyone on the show. It, it was just fabulous. Uh, I, I think uh, you, you mentioned this, pause for a second, because you mentioned Scarface, and mm -hmm. that was my number one reference, uh, being a part of the show. We had, uh, at least for me, for all five seasons, Scarface has always been a part of the grammar, if you will. I feel like going from, starting from one place, ending to another, that range, but we did it in five seasons. And the thing that's really cool for me 
for Scarface, which has a, a bit of a uh, homegrown touchstone, is that John Alonzo, who shot uh, Scarface, is from Dallas. And that's where oh. I was going to film school. He's a Texan. I'm a Texan, Mexican-American. Uh, he worked. He first got in into TV camera, camera work, uh, worked. We worked in the same kind of the same pattern uh, in Dallas. And then he went, but he was in, also in the acting side too, but he ended up going to Hollywood and then sh ultimately shooting Scarface and uh, Chinatown and all these other movies. But John Alonzo has been kind of a pattern for me to, to kind of follow in his footsteps because we had much common ground. And so for Scarface, I just, I remember when I first moved to Hollywood and I got into the union, they had a VHS tape in our union office said John Alonzo. I grabbed that VH, VHS tape and watched it. Every time we talked about Scarface, I didn't know in the future I'd be shooting a show very similar, <laughs> but we much ha very much had the same camera department path. Uh, um, but yeah, Scarface has a very, it, it's so consumed with the personal experience, so consumed about immigration, so consumed about being displaced, so consumed about identity. And even Scarface had a deeper reach because uh, you have to imagine growing up, my, even being introduced to cinema as a kid in, in elementary, in the third grade, when you're, when you're seven and eight, my aunts would take me to watch Cheech and Chong, right? And it's a comedy, but they're Latinos on the screen, but it's Cheech and Chong, uh, let's celebrate. But there wasn't that much depth in terms of that. So as a kid, you're running around, uh, you know, having this, this identity of seeing yourselves on screen, but having it be in a Cheech and Chong fashion as a kid. But the cinema experience, going with my aunts, eating popcorn, that part really stayed with me. And so when Queen of the South came, okay, yes, it's a cartel show, but how is a, as a person of color, how does a, a Latino, Latinx, what, whatever you have an identity to have always part of the discussion, how do we go to reclaim some sort of identity that we are people, that we have emotions beyond Cheech and Chong? So even when John Alonzo shot Scarface, I think they hit, hit some of those marks, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like carrying the torch forward from John Alonzo to Queen of South, even when I go on the shy, the dynamic of, of, of being in the barrio, but this is the shy. What are the common ground? Teenage pregnancy, right? Uh, not finishing school. There's a lot of um, uh, social injustice that what is the pattern of the city? What is the government? How are the roads? How is the structure? How is the city designed? There's a ton of questions to ask on the show and how to portray and talk with the showrunners and talk to the writer and say, hey, I experienced this. You know, my dad was a biker. This is the situation. How can we, how can I make that more as, as a kid looking at uh, uh, Latino bikers? What did that look like? And how can I have that part of Queen of the South? So, so there's a lot of personal experiences that I could use on Queen of the South. When I was an assistant, you know, I worked on Without a Trace. I worked on Big Love. I worked on uh, uh, Fast and Furious was a great multicultural show. But then you worked on, I worked on Flight Plan. I worked on Ali. There was not really a personal contributions that I could do. But when Queen and South came, it was every, every single script. Wow. I just soaked in and like, you're, you're right. How does this Afro Latino experience this? How does like, it had me ask more questions for our community, but by and large, how I can contribute these questions to other shows, whether I'm shooting in India, whether I'm shooting in Africa and having this displaced camera philosophy to ask questions and I think the cool thing is that these this will never stop because the more relationships you have the more you see into people's gifts the more it becomes so exciting just getting these scripts from show to show I, we get to have uh, opportunity to shine a light a little deeper than what is on the surface that we've maybe seen from generations prior mm -hmm. wow I, I love the fact that you mentioned people's gifts um because you know, and every you know, bring them all together. Then you have the magic that every everyone enjoys and and enriches our lives. Um, you've mentioned a lot about collaboration, um, and I know you worked on the first season of Cobra Kai, and now you're working with the teams that are currently working on Cobra Kai. Just tell us a little bit more about that. 
Yes, we're having breakthrough with our filmmakers and creators, directors, producers from Cobra Kai. Netflix has given them the opportunity to make a new series and it's an action dramedy, leaning a lot more towards action uh, for a new, new series called Obliterated. Uh, it's Netflix. We have a whole new cast, some people that we're going to get to dive in. If you fell in love with Johnny on Cobra Kai, you're going to fall in love with our characters now. It is so action-packed. It's like taking everything I've ever worked on in my life and pouring it on this show, like from helicopters. I mentioned earlier flying in helicopters. Mm -hmm. I'm, there's, I'm seeing the word helicopter, shooting it digitally, shooting plates, shooting on and off, shooting gimbals, shooting it on a bit on a Hollywood TV show. I'm actually starting to film these uh, combat. It's a combat elite team that goes to Vegas to save the world. And it's just loads of fun. And I feel like everything I've worked on Fast and Furious and uh, Flight Plan, like everything in Spider-Man, everything I learned technically was some days were blue screen, some days were these big 60, 80 foot uh, video screen walls like Mandalorian, like everything. We're throwing everything from the 80s action genre to a modern way of, of, of uh, new series for these guys. Uh, we're just throwing everything in the kitchen and having a, a loads of fun. It's, we're doing eight, eight episodes that'll be coming out on Netflix. I can't wait for everyone to see it. Uh, there's not so much social justice on this one, but it is <laughs> the human conditions there, the consequences of how we have to slug and go to work and, and, and go through the day's work. It's gonna be in a very heightened way Think, seen through the eyes of a combat team who are just a bunch of crazy fun characters absolutely can't wait when can we expect to to watch that um, we, we're maybe some at some point uh, i think uh, i don't have a date yet uh but just stay tuned i mean if you keep track to me on uh, instagram mm -hmm. uh we'll be giving an information along the way but it's called obliterated uh netflix but yeah feel free to tag along and find out as this story comes across the uh, the globe absolutely can't wait for that and um are there any uh, you've mentioned that as a, a forthcoming project uh, is there anyone that you particularly want to work with or are there any dream projects that you think i'd love to get involved with that i feel like every when i'm start going halfway through a season and i'm looking for the next project i definitely i, I definitely have I, everything up until now has had a social justice bent. Uh, 61st Street was a very uh, big one for me for AMC, which had to deal uh, with the uh, court, the court injustice in Chicago, uh, the, the, the arrest and going through the journey of somebody going through the court system there in, in the community. 61st Street, AMC with uh, Courtney B. Vance. Uh, that, that show uh, really takes uh, um, a pause when you get these scripts. Uh, uh, there's an, another series that came across about the immigrant experience that from Africa that really excited me, but it just didn't line up date wise. Uh, I, I just finished A National Treasure, mm -hmm. which I love, love, love that movie franchise. You could tell I'm a bit of a, a explorer, like a safari explorer, adventurer. Uh, at heart, even, even my kids and all of us, every every day we try to make a, an adventurous uh, situation happen for us. Whether I'm, um, but National Treasure was a very big big one for me when it came out on the radar. When it was out on the radar, I was like, I have to shoot this. I have to shoot National Treasure. There's, I was I came off on the heels of a courtroom drama and Queen of the South, and I said, you know what? Let's have a bit of fun. Let's let's let's. They, they, they reframed uh, National Treasure with an, a Latina lead, Latinx lead, recast a younger generation for, for a Mayan, uh, me, uh, Mexican uh, treasure hunt. And that for me was such a, a pleasure of an intersection. My, my wife and I, I, I said, you know, I, reading these scripts, I have to really know more about my ancestry. So I went through an ancestry, did the DNA had that that and just really paid them to find out more about my background and uh, finding r really bringing forth the indigenous art really I'm really into that right now with the with the Latin 
indigenous artwork and the history of art and reclaiming history. I feel there's a lot more stories to tell about the Alamo. There's a lot, the Tejano experience where I'm from Texas and uh, the Conquistador and all the tension and shame that has gone on for 500 years uh, of, of storytelling. There's, there's been a few, I, I'm feeling since I'm going more action, I might be probably doing a superhero, something superhero on the horizon. Uh, I'm absolutely loving being on Obliterated right now. So I'm, I, I'm really looking at going, now that the pandemic is, is with COVID, now if hopefully things get better, I'm, I, I think I'm gonna be going abroad. Whatever it is, I'm gonna kind of see, talk to my agent, see what, if there's something overseas. Maybe I can go, maybe if someone in Hollywood can make a movie in Kenya. Uh, I almost moved to India to uh, um, Hyderabad to mm -hmm. work there for a season. I looked for an apartment to live in. I was going to be a local DOP there. Uh, so open to a series abroad is kind of a wish list at the moment. I've wow. been cheating America looks for everywhere else, the places that I've been, but I'm looking for something, you know, really to do something adventurous. And on the TV side, movie side, I hope to shoot a movie. I hope to shoot a really beautiful, you know, maybe not so action movie that just really just dives in. <clears throat> uh, I still love uh, the idea of, of someone being displaced or a refugee story or something to, to have uh, some sort of storytelling, you know, something that's crossing border, something you know, has a little adventure, but just really personal. I think we can expect something really exciting from you in, in future, you know, with your passion and your um, well-versed in global culture. Uh, and your your pursuit of learning and development, I, I, I'm pretty sure we're going to expect some really exciting things from you. Um, you're so busy working and traveling, um, but I have to ask, if you get moments of enjoying TV or movies, what are some of your favorite titles that you can share with us? Well, well I'm, yes. I think before the shutdown for COVID, I was always working and I just watched nothing but movies. Now, TV shows are very exciting to watch now. Uh, I've been, I still watch a lot of documentaries. I think maybe we didn't touch about it so much right now, but I do shoot documentaries in between TV shows and movies. I have a couple of Netflix docs that are up uh, that I've shot and experienced because I still feel that documentaries are very experiential. Uh, just like my street photography. Um, but lately I've been watching Tokyo Vice. Mm -hmm. My buddy John Grillo, sh uh, DOP, shot Tokyo Vice. So I've been watching that. Uh, well, I just watched The Gray Man, which is a lot of fun. Uh, Loki was great. And we had, uh, our family enjoyed that one. Uh, you know, when I'm home, it's usually watching family oriented movies and documentaries. So, and, but I'm really addicted to shooting on my off time, which I don't have much off time, but I'm very much, uh, I love Fuji film cameras. So I'm always constantly doing, trying to shoot street photography and photography when I'm on the road, uh, to keep me busy. And they're kind of like eye exercises and composition and shadow and color so I'm obsessed with color, uh, always playing, uh, and I'm trying to sketch more, trying to draw more, get back to drawing, how I mentioned earlier, like in the third grade, just sketching, getting back to the fundamentals. Uh, so there I go from sketching to watching The Gray Man. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm excited by Extraction 2. Absolutely. That's coming yeah. out on yeah. Netflix, Can't wait for which that. is very exciting. And I'm crazy excited for National Treasure uh disney plus uh to come out um yeah we're, our family's watching uh miss marvel uh so we still we still as a family love mm -hmm. love these uh action action movies and of course scarface is probably top of the list scarface <laughs> city of god godfather yeah. i absolutely continuously watch those on and off uh yes uh that's that will uh, even now, I think I have some fun, some fun color schemes that I'm doing from Scarface on our show, Obliterated. Uh, yes. 
and I think if they ever made uh, Police Squad 3, I think you should be involved. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> that's the, that's, you know, it's funny because for... I, elite, elite, I squad, elite Squad, sorry, Elite Squad. Yeah, three. Yeah. yeah, Elite Squad. No, that's definitely... So Elite Squad, uh, there's a lot of choreography with the camera. Like, uh, I think if you watch Extraction, there's a lot of mm -hmm. choreography. I, I, you know, I think the camera has many platforms, but there's something to be said, like with, with Elite Squad and City of God and um, the global filmmaking from those genres from Brazil. Uh, I'm really getting into choreography. That's so why I'm trying to stay fit because if I can do a movie where it's a lot of choreography, uh, cause it's like dance Gr growing up. I didn't watch musicals that much. I think I am wanting to do a musical. I really want to do a musical, a lot, a la even Latino, be really cool. New York or Cuba or something, uh, with some choreography with the camera that, that is going to be something I've been building towards for many years. I focus a lot on lighting and painting. There's like, I have different seasons and I'm currently in the season of choreography, which is very open-ended. Uh, so I'm working with, with a, a great set choreographer uh, on Obliterated, uh, Brad Martin. And, uh, and of course, the team with Cobra Kai, they're interested into the martial arts. And so I feel like we're just getting started uh, as filmmakers of what we can do with choreography and the new toys. And sometimes just strip down being on your feet and uh, moving with the dancing with the actors. So I'm really leaning in towards choreography um, uh, with the camera and, and positioning. So uh, I can't wait, it's either dance or action, elite squad, I don't know yet. I think that the two worlds definitely blend together, whether you're shooting a gun, uh, trying to save the world or a beautiful romantic dance like we did on a national treasure. I think that's fabulous. And now, obviously, everyone's aware of all the, the, the famous big studio stuff um, that, that we mentioned before. But before I let you go, a, a quick plug. If people want to get to know your work through the lens, you mentioned some of the documentaries. What do they need to search for on Netflix? If you go on Netflix, I have I've was shot the American meme, which is uh, um, uncovering and looking into the consequences or the experiences of social media. And on that documentary, we shot an array of uh, people, uh, but mostly I did a lot, of, a lot of time with Paris Hilton on and off for two years on the American meme. Then we have a documentary, if you love EDM, speaking of dance, uh, the history of EDM, which is on Netflix, it's called uh, What We Started. And I got, had a wonderful opportunity to film many DJs. I love beats. Hip, hip hop is my first love, but dance music is my day to day. Uh, I love dance music. So I got to follow Carl Cox. He's from the oh, UK. Wow, okay. I got to follow Martin Garrix. So on and off for two and a half years, shooting DJs when I wasn't shooting TV or movies. Uh, I got to film Geta, David Geta. Wow. Uh, okay. uh, shot BPM Festival Ultra in Miami, went so many times back and forth from Ibiza filming DJs. Uh, um, but another history note on that, the very first DOP, director of photography I worked with, right right away after college and then the camera department uh, rental house, I was a Ralph Boda, ASC. He shot uh, Saturday Night Fever. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know all the disco dancing club, DJ days, and I felt it was like where he was, where he made such a dent in the disco area, it was good to finally take it from there. And I incorporated a few shots that he did of the feet of Martin Garrix walking to Ultra. I did a foot shot, uh, a throwback, uh, just a tip of the, a nod of the hat, uh, a nod to my old boss, Ralph Boda from Saturday Night Fever. I went to Martin Garrix, shot his feet, shot Carl Cox coming into Ibiza, uh, into his last DJ set. Uh, um, it, it was just such a, a great opportunity to carry the torch. Uh, but yeah, Netflix, two documentaries there. Um, there's quite a few others out there, but those two definitely can get right away on Netflix. Mm -hmm. and, and just follow me on Instagram. Uh, there's always something, uh, ongoing documentaries, ongoing projects. You, you get a little bit of the day of the life of, uh, 
of a photographer, street photographer, I'm more street photography than anything uh, day to day. That's incredible. Well, if my DJ career ever lifts off and uh, I want it filmed perfectly well, I know who to get in touch. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love, I love music. It's so exciting, whether you're shooting a DJ or performer on stage and sound systems, you know, my kid is, is making music. Uh, you know, he does everything electronically. He's going to music school. Uh, we're buying studio speakers. Wow. We're building him his own studio. Just how you would my other son, filmmaker, who was shooting with Black Magic, uh, you know, filmmaking. So a lot of tools, you know, it starts small, make a little mm -hmm. studio and start growing it from there and uh, making, you know, edit suites. And, and, and really, if your kid is interested and you see that they have a gift for it, how I mentioned earlier, pour into that gift. Uh, if they're interested, you know, buy them guitar and see where they go from there and just slowly build, you know, your system. Uh, uh, we're building a total sound studio for, for my son when he goes to college. So he has all the right Incredible. tools, his MacBook, his Pro Tools, everything he needs, you know, to make beats. Wow, there you go. Well, if we can ever collaborate, maybe help you get your studio up and running or your own home theater, then you know where to come. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we should definitely uh, link up when I come to the UK. You never know. Maybe absolutely. that's that's uh, maybe that's a project around the corner I get to absolutely. get to be a part of. We'll go watch a match, <laughs> a football <laughs> match. That, I, well, that dream is always ongoing. Well, mate, well, you could be watching plenty of matches soon near uh, in Pennsylvania. I, I hope. Yes, I have to. T then maybe I tell my agent I don't have anything around the corner, and I'll just be yeah. off for that. <laughs> <laughs> Abe, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your energy, your passion for sharing these stories. Uh, I think people are going to find this really, really entertaining and uh, you know, watch this space. I'm really excited for your work. Uh, we can't wait for Obliterated uh, and let's keep in touch for future projects. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's been great to share and uh, we'll see you around the corner. All the best. Thank you.